Hey everyone, Greg here with Science Studio, and I have noticed that over time, PC builders have tended to drift away from those large, bulky, overly ostentatious, full-size ATX towers, and progress towards more compact, small, and conservative cases, like the Fantex Evolve ITX case. If you missed my review on that case in particular, you can go ahead and click the link here and hop on over to that video. So what have we done here in the studio? Well, we built our first ITX PC. Now it doesn't look like a gaming console, it's not that small, but it also doesn't look very big and bulky like those full-size towers I was talking about. This is kind of a, a nice, I guess, in-between. So if you don't want something super small, but you don't want something very large that takes up a lot of space, then I think that a build similar to the one that you're about to see in this video is for you. So the first three things you're going to need if you want to build an ITX PC are one, your processor, two, an ITX motherboard, and three, some DDR3 or four, depending on what platform you're building on. In our case, we've gone with the Intel Core i5-6500, uh, and what we've paired that with is Gigabyte's H170N with built-in Wi-Fi. This is an ITX motherboard, so it's gonna be very small and it will fit in our Fantex case. But basically we've just gone with the H170 platform and saved a bit of money in this case because I personally feel that a 3.6 gigahertz turbo boost on an i5 like this is going to be plenty. And I don't wanna spend the extra money on custom cooling, you know, to get an effective overclock without the CPU fan running super, super loud, which I experienced in the last build of mine. So uh, should, be, should be just fine on an H170 motherboard with this particular CPU. Now, onto the RAM. The motherboard we've chosen only supports DDR4 at a frequency of 2133 MHz. This RAM that we've gone with is G-Skill, well, G-Skill Ripjaws 5. It comes with a factory overclock of 2400 MHz, although we won't be able to reach these frequencies just with the stock BIOS that we have running in it already. So just know that there's no compatibility issues between RAM running at a certain frequency and a motherboard only supporting a certain lower frequency. There's no problem there. This could have been 3200 MHz RAM for all intents and purposes. Still would have worked fine as long as your BIOS is configured correctly. So let's go ahead and assemble the heart of this computer. With those three parts that we've just laid out, go ahead and pull out your CPU. If you've gone with an i5 similar to ours, it's going to come with a stock Intel fan. Go ahead and set that aside for now, but we will be using that in our build. Pull out the processor itself and admire the sheer beauty of it. It's crazy that something this small is capable of processing so much data. Things are getting crazy. Next, move on over to your motherboard and go ahead and lift the latch protecting the CPU socket itself. With the socket door open, align the golden arrow on the CPU itself to the white arrow marked on the motherboard. These two arrows should be facing in the same direction when the processor is placed in the socket. Once the CPU is resting inside of the socket, go ahead and take that metal latch and close it up again. This will require some force. Don't worry, you're not gonna break your motherboard. Just don't do anything weird and crazy at this point. The black plastic guard will just pop right off at this point. Go ahead and set it to the side. Don't throw this away because if you need to RMA your motherboard in the future, you will have to reinsert this over the socket to protect it during shipping. Go ahead and pull out your single or twin set of RAM modules. Pull back on the levers on the motherboard and gently slide each of these DIMMs into place. You will find that inserting these memory modules will require some force, about as much force as it took to you know, reinsert that lever hatch over the CPU socket. Just make sure your motherboard is secured to whatever it's resting on and snap each side of each DIMM into place. You'll find that that lever will snap back upright once the DIMM is successfully secured. Refer to your motherboard's user manual to confirm which fan header corresponds to the CPU fan. Next comes the CPU cooler installation. Now, if you've done what we've done and just decided to go bare bones and you know opt for the stock Intel cooler, this won't take much force at all to insert. Literally just align the four pins over the four holes and make sure that the black little, I guess, shafts inside of the white prongs poke all the way through on the back side of the motherboard. If you have to hold the board in some awkward positions to get this to work, no worries. The board might flex a little bit, just don't, you know, kill it. Don't kill it, don't kill your motherboard. If you're a schnazzier PC gamer and have decided to custom cool your CPU with either a water block or, I don't know, something like a Hyper 212 Evo, refer to those directions when it comes to installing those units. Some are a bit tricky, just make sure to follow directions. You should be okay. Go ahead and untangle that fan connector. Mine was kind of just wrapped all up inside of the fan itself. Make sure that it's not touching the fan in any way, and then run that cable into the fan header that corresponds to your CPU fan. 
So that is it. The entire motherboard has been assembled. Now comes the merge. Yes, we are going to merge our motherboard unit with the RAM and the CPU and the CPU cooler all installed into the case itself. I recommend doing this before doing anything else in the case because this is the heart and soul of the build and you want this nice and secured in there before installing your power supply and cables and whatnot. It just gets messy. So let's go ahead and put the important stuff in there first. In my case, it just required four screws each on each corner of the squarish ITX form factor and that's it. It's secure. So we can go ahead and turn our tower itself upright and admire the beauty of, well, the heart and soul of our PC. Next, if you're using our case in particular, go ahead and remove the shelf that comes included with the case. There are two screws in the front underneath the Fantex logo and there are two more screws from the back. Once all four of these screws are removed, the little metal panel should just slide right out. What I personally decided to do next was install the graphics card. In our case, we've chosen a Gigabyte WinForce R9 380 4GB graphics card. I've chosen this graphics card for a number of reasons. The most obvious being that it's, it's a pretty good bang for the buck. Uh, it is more powerful in most cases than a GTX 960 with the same amount of VRAM uh, and is actually a bit cheaper in some cases. So regardless of what GPU you've decided to go with, go ahead and insert it at this point. Once the coast is clear, go ahead and slide your graphics card into the motherboard. Be sure that the PCIe slot lever is disengaged. Please don't try to slide that card into a, you know, into a wall. Basically, it's, it's just not going to work. So don't break that. That's, that's an important, nice little latch to have. I forgot to reinstall the white little bracket that was on here originally, but I went ahead and did that in a later step. So we've got the graphics card and the motherboard installed already. Now let's move on to the power supply. In our case, we've gone with an EVGA 430 watt 80 plus power supply. Don't worry, this is plenty of power for our system. Our i5-6500 literally sips on power. I'd like to refer to a YouTube comment that I thought was very descriptive and very accurate as to how Skylake CPUs utilize power. So power allocation on an Intel Skylake CPU is great. And so we're looking at maybe at a max 100 TDP I know they're rated at like 65 TDP, but under load, they're going to draw about 100 watts of power. And our R9 380 under load is going to draw about 200, maybe 220 watts of power. So, you know, use our little wattage calculation tool, take the total TDPs, multiply by safety factor of 1.5, and you get, yeah, 450-ish watts. 430 is going to be just fine. You're not going to have any problems with power if you go with what we've gone with. So at this point, go ahead and slide that PSU into place underneath the board. In the case of our case, we had to insert the power supply from the right side of the case rather than the back just because of, you know, its design, but no biggie there. It's actually easier to do it this way because you don't have to funnel any cables through the back of the case. Secure the power supply with the four included screws, either the screws included with your power supply or the ones included with the case. Sometimes you get two sets. That's, that's nice to have. You get four and four. So, no, save a set. Maybe you'll need them someday. Now, the order of these next steps really doesn't matter. Uh, it just comes down to preference and what you think is easier to do first. What I like to do first is plug in all of those small little case cables into the headers on my motherboard. Grab the power switch connector, hard drive LED connector, you know, reset switch, whatever's included with your case, and refer to your motherboard manual to confirm that where you're inserting these cables is actually correct. You know, because if you plug these in the wrong way, maybe sometimes you'll plug the negative into the positive and vice versa, those buttons won't work. Sometimes you plug the power switch in the wrong way and then your system won't boot when you push the power button on top. Make sure that you refer to your manual unless you know this motherboard like the back of your hand and be sure that these leads are connected into the proper headers and in the proper orientation. Now, remember that metal shelf that we removed earlier in order to install our graphics card? Well, we've left that off up to this point for a reason. So at this point, go ahead and grab any solid state drives you might have lying around. I recommend the solid state drive in any PC build, including the most you know, conservative and cheap PC builds out there, just because they make everything seem a lot more snappy and fluid, even if you don't have all that fast of a processor. Go ahead and pull out that SSD, remove the SSD mount on the right side of the tower itself, and then mount the solid state drive to this tray. The tray at this point can be secured to that metal shelf, which we can then reinsert into the tower. Once you've completed this step, you should have a nice and flashy solid state drive resting atop the shelf, visible to all of your guests, friends, and family. I don't know, I like showing off the fact that I have an SSD. Some people don't care. 
I think it's kind of cool to say, yeah, I got an SSD in there, even though that SSD was like 40 bucks, but they don't need to know that. At this point, you should also secure any hard disk drives or additional solid state drives into the case. In the case of our case, we have two hard disk drive little cage mounts that we can remove and then kind of secure to our hard drives themselves. And these just slide right back into the case. Simple as that, no problem. If you have a solid state drive, you can also screw in the solid state drive from the bottom and keep that nice and secure, even though you could really just throw that solid state drive anywhere in the case at all. And it'll probably be just fine. With that, it's time to wire up all of the power connectors. This will involve the power supplies connectors themselves that are kind of just scattered at this point, kind of around the case, but not really in the case. So you want to connect the either 4-pin or 8-pin CPU power connector, probably near the top of the motherboard, the 24-pin power connector, most likely on the side of your motherboard, and then you'll want to run the either 6 or 8-pin or 6 or 8-pin combo to the front of the case. It was nice to be able to keep the graphics power connector nice and hidden. Go ahead and plug either that one set or two set of cables into your graphics card as well. Plug in the power connector for all of your hard disk drives and solid state drives, and make sure to keep everything nice and tidy back there. Our Fantex case includes a nice little set of Velcro straps to keep things very close to the chassis itself, allowing for a more pleasant left panel reinsertion. If you have any case fans, including the case fan that's included with our case, go ahead and plug those cables into their respective headers. We only had one additional fan header, so we only have one additional fan in our case. Nice 200 millimeter fan, I should add. The last thing we did with our build was plug in an NZXT LED light kit. This is just a white LED kit and we kind of just ran all the lights on the top where a radiator could be mounted if you wanted a water cooling solution. So the moment of truth, does it work? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously it works because it's right there. But uh, I included the first, you know, round of turning things on because I wanted to show you that, well, Everything worked the first time around. Now I did confirm beforehand that all of the parts were functional. I assembled it all outside of the case, but you never know, something could go wrong during the actual installation of the parts. So it is always a relief to see a post on the screen like the one that you're seeing right now. I will also be uploading a video in which this computer will be run through my series of benchmarks that I've used in previous benchmarking videos. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and click the link here. It's probably not there if you're watching this when this video is first released, but uh, when it is there, go ahead and click that. I think you'll be interested to see just how well this computer handles video games, computer rendering, and things of that sort. So without further ado, I present to you an ITX build. I'm glad that you were interested in this video. I think that ITX is the way of the future for computers. I think that more and more people are converting to ITX builds just because they find that, well, you're getting just as much power and just as much performance and just as many options, with the exception of the additional PCIe slots and things like that all for about the same price. So yeah, that's kind of my take on why ITX builds are becoming more popular. Maybe you just want an HTPC or something like that. HTPC stands for home theater, personal computer, by the way. So, you know, something that you would have in like a living room, something to watch TV, stream YouTube, things like that. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to leave a like or a dislike and or a comment below. Be sure to subscribe for more. Let me know what you'd like to see next. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.